1996, the city of Cleveland celebrates the 200th anniversary of its founding by Moses Cleveland. The city's rise from a struggling, malaria-infested frontier settlement to a modern economic community can be viewed as a result of steadily improving economic development. Moses Cleveland's trip to this area was part of a business deal. A group of investors called the Connecticut Land Company bought a large section of northeastern Ohio from the state of Connecticut for $1.2 million. Cleveland, who led the surveying expedition west in 1796, was a Yale graduate, a lawyer, and a state legislator, as well as a founder of the land company. The land he surveyed is often called the Western Reserve of Connecticut. The surveying party located their settlement along the southern shore of Lake Erie at the mouth of the Cuyahoga River. The waterways, it was felt, would facilitate transportation and growth in the lands of the Western Reserve. Cleveland paid the Six Nations Indians two beef cattle, 100 gallons of whiskey, and 500 pounds in New York State currency for the right to settle the eastern banks of the Cuyahoga. By the end of summer, Cleveland's party had divided the settlement into a central 10-acre public square surrounded by many 220-acre lots. Lorenzo Carter, the first white pioneer to settle this disease-ridden swampland, ran a tavern and post office, operated a ferry, and controlled the local Indian trade. By 1824, Cleveland was a thriving port, shipping goods worth over $234,000. However, overall growth for the new city remained slow because of the harsh and inhospitable conditions. In 1832, the Ohio and Erie Canal, connecting Lake Erie at Cleveland with the Ohio River at Portsmouth, provided water transportation to southern Ohio, the eastern United States, and overseas. Cleveland was given two federal grants for harbor improvement to handle the increase in shipping. Population grew rapidly during this time, and in 1836, Cleveland was incorporated as a city. German and Irish laborers came to work off their passages to America by digging the four-foot-deep canal. Shipping on the canal and on Lake Erie made Cleveland the area's main industrial link to the world. Workers moved in to process, store, and transfer goods shipped through the port. Warehouses were built. Farmers sent livestock and crops for outside markets through Cleveland. Machinery to open foundries and factories could easily be shipped into the city. Banks moved in to finance the new undertakings. Insurance companies opened offices to protect shipping and emergent industry. In a scant 10 years, Cleveland had grown into a major Great Lakes port. The boom town of 1840 didn't develop without its share of economic strife, however. In 1836, the new Columbus Street Bridge allowed people to deliver goods directly into Cleveland and bypass Ohio City on the Cuyahoga's West Bank. Violence erupted into what was called the Bridge War. Nearly a thousand Ohio City men carrying clubs, rocks, and rifles fought with Cleveland's mayor and militiamen, armed with muskets and an ancient cannon. The battle finally stopped after the Cleveland Marshal posted guards at both ends of the bridge to keep traffic moving. By 1850, the canal was eclipsed in importance by the faster and more efficient railroad. The first train ran between Cleveland and Columbus in 1851. At the end of the decade, Cleveland had become a major rail center. Five lines linked the city not only with Columbus, but with Chicago, Cincinnati, and the eastern United States. The iron rails for Cleveland's first railway had to be imported from England, but by the mid-1850s, the opening of the Sault Ste. Marie Canal connecting Lakes Huron and Superior, the discovery of iron ore in the Mesabi Range, and the mining of coal in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia all decreed that Cleveland would become a leading center of metal manufacture. Later, the Civil War, with its demand for cannons and rail transportation, firmly established the city as an excellent place to locate industrial and manufacturing plants. While Cleveland's geographical location contributed much to its early economic success, 
the driving forces behind the area's progress in the latter half of the 19th century were the industrialists. Wealthy entrepreneurs such as John D. Rockefeller, Charles F. Brush, Jephthah Wade, and Ambrose Swayze built elegant mansions along Euclid Avenue. The street, known as Millionaire's Row, was said to be one of the most beautiful in the country. While the magnificent houses and spacious lawns are gone, the businesses these men founded live on. In 1852, Charles A. Otis opened the Lake Erie Iron Works on Whiskey Island. After the Civil War, Otis studied European methods of steel making in England and Prussia. The acid open hearth process reduced costs, production time, and the carbon content of steel. Otis Steel merged with Jones and Laughlin Steel Company of Pittsburgh in 1942, joining together the oldest two U.S. steel makers. The company expanded rapidly during World War II by making steel plate for battleships. When Ling Temco Vought Corporation, LTV, acquired JNL in 1974, it became the third largest steel producer in the U.S. Other steel companies which invested heavily in Cleveland were the United States Steel Company, now closed, and Republic Steel, which today, as part of LTV, operates a world-class continuous caster in Cleveland. 1856 saw businessman Jephthah Wade move to Cleveland. The telegraph company he founded, Western Union, grew into the world's first telecommunications conglomerate. Perhaps because of his own difficulties in finding a job upon graduation, bookkeeper John D. Rockefeller didn't fail to notice the many oil refineries springing up on the banks of the Cuyahoga. This son of a patent medicine salesman from Strongsville, Ohio, decided the burgeoning oil industry was the place to invest. In 1870, he chartered the Standard Oil Company, together with Samuel Andrews and other investors. This company became Ohio's first million-dollar corporation and made Rockefeller the richest man in the world. By 1882, Rockefeller owned 90% of the nation's refining capacity, and Cleveland became the leading oil refinery city in the nation. Standard Oil remained a familiar presence on the economic front under such names as Exxon, Esso, and Sohio. Today, the company lives on as part of multinational British Petroleum with important oil leases on Alaska's North Slope. U.S. headquarters of BP America are still in the city. Sherwin-Williams Company, one of the country's leading paint manufacturers, built an office and warehouse along Canal Street in the Flats. The company founders were Edwin P. Williams, Sereno Peck Fenn, and 24-year-old Henry Sherwin, who invested his entire life savings of $2,000 to become a partner. Francis Harrington Glidden founded the Glidden Company in 1875. As Adrian Joyce, who bought the company in 1917, became increasingly aware of the link between oil in food and oil in paint, he experimented with the use of soybeans, both as a nutritious food additive and as a color retention agent in paint. Glidden still retains offices in the Cleveland area. Most oil company roughnecks of the late 19th century prayed to find oil and not natural gas. After John D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company began using gas for energy and actually drilled for gas, the Hope Natural Gas Company built a pipeline leading from Standard Oil's West Virginia gas fields across the mountains to Ohio. By 1902, the East Ohio Gas Company had continued the pipeline north to Akron and into Cleveland. By 1987, it was serving one million customers. Iron and coal magnate Marcus A. Hanna became known as the President Maker for his management of the 1896 and 1900 presidential campaigns of William McKinley. Financing almost the whole campaigns himself, Hanna bombarded the public with an advertising blitz the likes of which had never been seen in the U.S., setting the stage for politics American style. Worcester Reed Warner, 
and Ambrose Swayze founded the machine tool firm of Warner and Swayze in 1880 in Chicago. But a lack of skilled workers forced the company to relocate to Cleveland in 1881. Warner and Swayze built milling machines and lathes used in the manufacture of sewing machines, bicycles, and automobiles. Because of Warner's avid interest in astronomy, the company also became known worldwide for the manufacture of precision instruments and telescopes. This led to Cleveland's becoming a leader in the machine tool industry. The American Greetings Corporation was started in 1906 by Jacob Saperstein as a one-man greeting card company in his home. Today, the company employs about 3,000 Clevelanders and is one of the world's leading suppliers of greeting cards and related products. The post-Civil War period, with its rapid industrial expansion, attracted further thousands of immigrants from Eastern and Central Europe to the Cleveland area. In 1919, 50% of all steel mill workers were Polish, but World War I and changing, more restrictive immigration policies slowed European immigration. As the Second World War increased the demand for workers, a generation of Puerto Ricans took their turn in the steel mills. When new consumer demands after the war attracted another influx of labor, Southern blacks and Appalachians were added to the 55 ethnic groups forming the social fabric of the city. As Cleveland grew in size and population, the demand for a more civilized, orderly, and fulfilling existence developed among citizens and community leaders alike. In order to develop the stability and infrastructure that would promote commercial development, Cleveland designed its city services along the lines of other large American cities. Police and fire departments, transportation, parks, recreation, health care, roads, education, and the municipal government itself. They all played a part in attracting both industry and the people of many nations to work in those industries. Beginning in the 1890s, one of the first services offered to new immigrants were the settlement houses. The city's first settlement house was Hiram House, built in 1896. It first helped Jewish, then later African-American populations along Lower Woodland Avenue. Alta House on Murray Hill, established in 1900, served Italian-Americans by offering a children's nursery and education program. Neither businesses nor people can thrive in an atmosphere of lawlessness, and so from its very first days, Cleveland concerned itself with keeping its citizens safe. 1800 saw the building of the city's first jail and the election of Lorenzo Carter and Stephen Gilbert as constables. When Cleveland was incorporated as a city in 1836, a martial system of law enforcement was established. In the 1920s and 30s, the Cleveland Police Department was considered one of the most progressive in the nation. In 1923, Cleveland inventor Garrett A. Morgan received a patent for the traffic signal. The Cleveland Police Department Women's Bureau was begun in 1925. In 1929, when the police department installed its first radio transmitter, Cleveland became the first city to have its own station and to be assigned its own FCC wavelength. It was the second American city to equip cars with radio receivers. The city's 1935 safety director, Elliot Ness, reorganized and reformed the police department by forming the Cleveland Untouchables, one of the most catastrophic events that could befall early settlers was fire. In 1829, Cleveland's Live Oaks No. 1 Volunteer Fire Unit purchased its first hand-operated fire engine. By 1835, there were four volunteer fire companies, two engine companies, a hook and ladder company, and a hose company. In 1863, the first professional steam fire department was made up of 53 men. Today, the Cleveland Fire Department employs around 950 people and responds to an average 55,000 service calls a year. Early water needs were met by wells, cisterns, and the Cuyahoga River. Increasing pollution from industrial waste and sewage eventually led Clevelanders to build a series of water intake cribs in Lake Erie 
and over 5,800 miles of water mains. 58 people died in bringing the city's homes fresh water at the turn of a faucet handle. When the victims of a 1916 explosion and their rescuers were overcome by gas, survivors were helped to safety by Clevelander Garrett A. Morgan's invention, the gas mask. The waterworks at West 48th Street are named in his honor. From its incorporation as a city in 1836, Cleveland was authorized by the Ohio State Legislature to impose taxes to support a public school system. The first Cleveland public school was Bethel Union School. Built to provide a free education for the poor children who lived in the flats, this school was nicknamed the Ragged School because of the poor condition of the children's clothing. Cleveland's Central High School was the first public high school to provide free secondary education west of the Alleghenies. Central students included John L. Severance, John D. Rockefeller, Marcus Hanna, Samuel Mather, and Langston Hughes. In 1936, Hazel Mountain Walker became its first black principal. During the 1920s, vocational classes were increased and 1924 saw the opening of the Girls' Opportunity School. Formed to help female students who were discouraged with traditional academic work, girls here were taught vocational subjects such as cooking, hygiene, and home nursing. It later became the Jane Addams School. Today, the Cleveland school system comprises 127 schools and serves some 70,000 students. The need for a university in Cleveland was recognized quite early in the city's history. In 1801, David Hudson had already petitioned the Territorial Legislature of Ohio to establish a college academy in the area. Western Reserve Academy began operation in 1826 at its original location in Hudson, Ohio. It later moved to University Circle in Cleveland and after merging with the Case Institute of Technology, became Case Western Reserve University. Cleveland's Fenn College began as an outgrowth of the YMCA's evening education program of the 1880s. By 1923, Fenn offered classes in business and engineering for college credit. The college was named after Sereno Peck Fenn, co-founder of Sherwin-Williams, and originator of the Cleveland YMCA's education program. Costs were kept low to attract students who couldn't afford other colleges and universities. Today, Fenn College is part of Cleveland State University and offers graduate degrees in 29 fields from law to physics and undergraduate degrees in 60 subject majors. Higher education is well recognized as an element of success in Cleveland. CSU, Case Western Reserve University, Cuyahoga Community College, and the six other degree-granting institutions in the area had a combined enrollment of over 54,000 students in the fall of 1994. About 8% of Cleveland's area workers are employed in the healthcare industry. The 10 hospitals within city limits include the world-famous Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals. University hospitals, which began during the Civil War as the Home for Friendless Strangers, a hospital for wounded Confederates, was the first medical facility in the U.S. to use whole body magnetic resonance scanning and the first to use heart defibrillation. St. Vincent Charity Hospital helped to develop the heart-lung machine. The world's first human-to-human -human blood transfusion was performed at St. Alexis Hospital in 1906. Because early settlers were surrounded by trees and forest, they saw no need for parks. And even if they did, frontier life left them little time for recreation. By 1865, attitudes had changed, and city council was alarmed to find that Cleveland was far behind most cities of its class in the acquisition of parkland. In 1882, Jephthah Wade, Cleveland citizen and founder of the Western Union Telegraph Company, donated 64 wooden acres to become the city's first large park. Wade Park later became University Circle, site of the Cleveland Art Museum, the Natural History Museum, and Severance Hall. 
At Cleveland's centennial celebration in 1896, Cleveland millionaire John D. Rockefeller donated 276 acres along the Doan Brook, along with $300,000 to help pay for land the city had already acquired in the area. This land became known as Rockefeller Park. Cleveland's mayor of 1901, Tom L. Johnson, who was called the best mayor of the best governed city in America for his efforts at reforming city government, set the goal of providing the most crowded sections of the city with playgrounds. Winter sports included ice skating and skating races at Brookside and Rockefeller Parks. Summers included baseball and tennis, as well as municipal dances at Edgewater and Woodland Hills Parks. Citizens could go to their local park and hear band concerts on Sunday evenings. Cleveland Metro Parks, a system of recreation, conservation, and wildlife areas on more than 19,000 acres surrounding the city, was the dream of William A. Stinchcomb, Cleveland's city park engineer. Stinchcomb advocated the creation of parks along the outer edges of the metropolis as early as 1905. His dream became a reality in 1917. The Cleveland Zoo began with a herd of deer in Wade Park in 1882. Because of the complaints of residents in the increasingly urban area, the zoo was relocated to its present position within Brookside Park in 1916. The zoo was renamed Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo in 1975 when it became part of the Cleveland Metro Parks. Since then, it has undergone a development program unmatched in its history and has added the primate, cat, and aquatics building, the birdhouse, and the rainforest. Spectator sports and recreational activities in today's Cleveland are varied and exciting. Professional sports teams include Indians baseball, Cavaliers basketball, Browns football, crunch soccer, and lumberjacks hockey. Events scheduled for the amusement of citizens each year are the Cleveland National Air Show, the Cleveland Grand Prix Auto Race, traditional 4th of July fireworks, boating and sailing events, rib cook-offs, ethnic heritage festivals, and professional theater at Cleveland Playhouse and at Playhouse Square. The city's art and natural history museums offer special exhibits throughout the year. The lakefront includes the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the ore carrier museum ship, the William G. Mather, and the soon-to-be-opened Great Lakes Science Center. City parks remain inviting places to enjoy a quiet day or to play amateur sports. Cleveland's cultural institutions were created with the same panache as its industries. Indeed, one 1928 commentator wrote, All community achievements seem easy in Cleveland. The visitor fancies that someone waves a hand and museums, libraries, orchestras, and art schools come into being forthwith. The Cleveland Public Library, founded in 1869, rented its first quarters at Superior and Public Square. In 1890, construction of 15 neighborhood branch libraries was begun with a gift of $590,000 from Andrew Carnegie. A 1903 collection of books in Braille began service for the blind. The present main library on Superior Avenue opened on May 6, 1925. With 28 branches and two and a half million titles, Cleveland's library is the largest public research library in Ohio. The internationally renowned Cleveland Museum of Art first opened to the public in June of 1916 on land donated by Jephthah Wade. The museum has benefited from the generosity of Cleveland's wealthiest citizens who over the years donated money for acquisitions or gave their own collections to the museum. Admission to the museum is still free. The Cleveland Orchestra is the result of many years of hard work by Clevelander Adela Prentice Hughes. After bringing visiting ensembles to the city, Hughes formed the Musical Arts Association to develop a local orchestra. The Cleveland Orchestra gave its first benefit concert in 1918. In 1931, 
a generous gift from businessman John L. Severance, in memory of his wife, enabled the Musical Arts Association to build the orchestra a permanent home in Severance Hall. The orchestra has toured and recorded extensively under such world-renowned conductors as George Sell, Lauren Maisel, and Christoph von Donanyi. Cleveland's economy, once dominated by heavy manufacturing, oil refining, and steel, is today more diversified. Cleveland's port has remained the largest overseas harbor front on Lake Erie and the third largest port on the Great Lakes. The city is a center of rail transportation, trucking, and air cargo shipping at two major airports. Roughly one quarter of the city's workers are employed in the service sector in fields such as law, education, business and personal service, engineering, health care and health education, accounting, and hotel jobs. Research and technology in such areas as medicine, biotechnology, aerospace technology, and polymers will help guide Cleveland's economy into the future. Brilliant entrepreneurs, industrial giants, and thousands of hard-working laborers all played a role in shaping Cleveland's last 200 years into a proud history. The economic foundation laid down by these people is strong and full of hope. In Cleveland's third century, just as in the city's first two centuries, business as usual promises to be something quite extraordinary.